Hi hey everyone, welcome to week 10. We're starting a new module and this new module, uh, we're going to explore uh, uh, the alternatives to capitalism as a way to think uh, transnational networks and actors and even to critique the very idea of transnational networks and, and, and global actors. But before I actually get into the video lecture, I want you to stop if you haven't done this already and watch the uh, documentary in Canopy, Capital in the 21st Century. While you're doing that, I want you to um, have three concepts ready and you can, uh, have them, you can have them just sketched out or you can just uh, get the minute uh, uh, and the, the person who talks about that, that idea in the, in the documentary. I have it ready for the tutorial in order to do a sort of compare, compare and contrast of those concepts with uh, the principles that I will be talking in this lecture. And these are the three principles here. And these three principles will make more sense once you finish the video lecture. So the idea is watch the, watch the documentary first, have your three concepts ready for the tutorial. Once you have those concepts ready for the tutorial, then come and watch this, uh, this this video lecture. Okay, so do that, and now I will start with the with the actual content of the video lecture. And the first thing that uh, I want us to think about is precisely why alternatives to capitalism and thinking capitalism in terms of the alternatives to it. Why is that important to uh, uh, reflect on transnationalism? And, and the, the idea is that, that we can also think it the other way around. How is it that uh, reflecting on, trans, on capitalism can give us a better sense of how transna transnationalism work or may not work, right? And we want to do this beyond the in the economicist perspective. Uh, when I say economicist perspective, I'm not saying I'm not saying economics. So I'm, I'm, I'm what I'm referring to is the tendency in the field of economics to reduce all human activity and all systems, all political system as a question of economics, as a question of uh, economic productivity uh, and, uh, and the systems that, that, that produce uh, that uh, effectiveness and productivity uh, in terms of numbers, right? in terms of numbers. Um, so I'm trans, trans, number one, transnationalism allows us to think of neoliberal capitalism, you know, the late part of capitalism, our current form, form of capitalism, from beyond this economicist perspective, beyond this tendency to reduce everything to a question of productivity, of systems productivity. On, on, a, second, on, a, on a second note, uh, capitalism is by definition transnational. So it's important, it's, a, it's already an in into understanding uh, transnational flows. Uh, but this uh, reflection uh, of capitalism and the alternatives will allow us to think also not only in terms of, not only beyond the economist's perspective, uh, but also outside the common critiques of capitalism. And the most common critique of capitalism is being carried out by Marxian, Marxian or Marxist. Uh, I like the term Marxian better than Marxist, but you know, for different reasons, just because I think there's a tendency to reduce uh, uh, Mar Marxian uh, economics to what Marx, Marx has to say, therefore Marxist economic. But, when we say Marxian is everything that is derived from uh, Marxist, uh, from 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 Marx uh, writing, so all that all the all the tradition, 
right? But that's maybe a too too much technical, uh, too much technical term. Uh, that is really not that important. But the point being that the common critique is that of Marx and political economy, right? Um, and and the problem that I see with looking at this the critique the uh, the capitalism and its alternative in terms of uh, the capitalist economy and the critiques of that capitalist term, economy most commonly produced by a Marxian uh, political economy is that that analysis can easily get stuck on just labor power struggles on class tension and this reduces the conflict to to, to adjust a materialist relation that is as a question that is just fundamentally about accumulation and dispossession. And while that is very important, that, that approach, that dialectic, that binary of the capitalist economic economics and the economicist perspective that the economics field tend to have of capitalism and its other, its critique, that is Marx and political economy as two sides of the same coin, that doesn't really allow us to think of, of how other actors within capitalism, such as the state, democracy, or liberalism, liberalism, which are the most common ones, how those can play a different role outside that dynamic and even in parallel to such a dynamic. And the angle that I'm taking is that is that angle, it's a sociological, anthropological angle. Uh, and then and then from that soci sociological and, and anthropological angle, I'm thinking, I'm considering the importance of the cultural history that 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 this different other that other actors outside that binary, that other actors outside the binary of traditional. Uh, capitalist economics and the critiques of capitalist economics, i.e., Marx and political economy. How other other approaches can can rethink the state, democracy, but um, things like the good life from the point of view of their own cultural histories and what I will uh, later uh, term as the, um, the a theoretical praxis. Uh, a theory that is in place. And this will allow us to think of an alternative to capitalism that is not so much an alternative, but a, a parallel uh, thought process to capitalist imagination. And capitalist imagination here uh, includes both anti-capitalists and capitalists, right? So I want to think outside that um that that binary thinking that dialectic uh more traditional dialectic which doesn't mean that those that that way of thinking is incorrect it it, it is just that for our own purposes of thinking from a transnational uh point of view uh this anthropological sociological appro approach is much more productive and to me it's also much, uh, much more interesting. Yeah. So let's start with sociologists um, from UC Ryan, uh, UC Davis, sorry, Fred Blocks, uh, Fred Block, and and he has a really interesting take, uh, linguistic take. So just so it's an introduction of how to think uh, about capitalism from a sociological point of view. So just let's hear him out, and then I'll keep going. Uh, so ba basically, um, I, I think that what I'm doing is very much complementary to what uh, Mariana has done, and particularly in her new book, The Value of Everything, which I recommend uh, very highly. Uh, she's essentially saying that we've lost, because of the uh, tradition of mainstream economics, we've lost the capacity uh, to separate value creation from value extraction. Uh, we don't know what's going on 
um, and the consequence is that we've created economies where uh, there's tremendous priority on value extraction um, rather than, than value creation. And so we're both saying that um, our inherited concepts leave us uh, seeing the economy through a distorting set of lenses. And it's here that the Thomas Pynchon quote is, is accurate, you know, that if you're asking the wrong questions, you know, the powers that be don't really have to, uh, to worry about the, um, the answers. So um, my kind of starting point um, is um, to make this argument that we're uh, victims uh, deluded by what I'm calling the capitalist delusion, and I'll try to explain what I mean by that, and then I'm going to kind of provide some of the tools for challenging that illusion uh, so that we can uh, see the economy um, through a, a different set of lenses that open up possibilities for uh, political change and, and reform that um, is, is urgently um, needed. Now, um, the, um, the idea of the capitalist illusion here is um, very closely linked to episodes of what I call linguistic larceny. And um, in our histories, uh, we don't emphasize this enough, but I think that's extremely important. And so if you think back to your history, kind of in the decades from about 1890 to 1910, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, there was a systematic effort uh, by thinkers to redefine liberalism. Liberalism had always meant economic liberalism, laissez-faire. Um, and what the social liberals did um, and the anticipating figure in England was P.H. Green, who was uh, writing a little bit earlier, but people like Hobson and Hobhouse uh, were important. Um, what they did was that they essentially redefined liberalism to the uh, social liberalism, political liberalism, to using the state to solving the problems of the, that created by the market economy. And the, the economic liberals at the time were outraged. They said, you can't take our word, you know, liberalism, you know, and they screamed and yelled, but it essentially, their screaming and yelling didn't make any difference. Um, basically, the larceny worked. And what it did for pretty much 70 years was it put the market liberals on the back foot because they had lost control of the language. And those were the 70 years, you know, that if you look at Thomas Piketty's diagrams, uh, where ordinary people made substantial economic gains and there was some notion, you know, that equality was a, a good thing. So my argument is that basically um, starting um, somewhat in the 1960s, but accelerating in the 1970s, the uh, supporters of market liberalism got their revenge. And they got their revenge by taking the word capitalism and stealing it and infusing it with new meanings. So they did the same operation of linguistic larceny. And as a consequence, they put the left um, and the center on, on the back foot. And they've been essentially um, in charge ever since. Um, now, obviously, I recognize that you know, they also have big piles of money and think tanks and all kinds of other um, things. But the linguistic larceny looms very, very large. So, see, this is a, a, a take of, of how the concept that are within the essence of capitalism has, has changed um, and how they evolved we need the so-called Western tradition. And especially if you compare the, the concept of liberalism or liberal uh, in, from the, in the American tradition and the European tradition, you see that difference. How in the, uh, although it's uh, because of the influence of American politics, now liberalism uh, is still uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's changing in the European traditions. The European tradition, liberalism is 
uh, it's it's understood to be laissez faire economics. It's basically you know free market economics, um, but that is changing uh, because precisely in in the U.S. the idea of liberalism uh, has to do with progressive politics, and and that those differences. Um, has to do precisely with that, with the appropriations of language and what it, what something means, uh, and um, the imagination it creates, and especially also with asking the right questions, um, uh, in order to get uh, dangerous answers. Uh, so then, one of the questions that when we think about the alternative to capitalism, when we think about anti-capitalism, it's how can we imagine the end of capitalism? That's what we're really implying when we say an alternative to capitalism. We're just not saying, hey, let's um, create a bubble. What we're really saying is, can we imagine the end of capitalism? Uh, Mark Fisher uh, in Capitalist Realism, um, um, uh, really, uh, here it is. It's a, it's a fantastic book. It's really, really small, uh, but I really recommend it if you have the chance to actually uh, check it out from the library or just buy it. Um, it's a really fun book to read. And uh, Mark Fisher in there uh, says that watching, and then this is a throwback to week three, is Children of Men is one of those like pivotal uh, film to understand uh, to understand capitalism from a cultural point from from a point from a cultural point of view, basically. And that's why it's been so important, uh, apart from being a, a quite good movie, in my opinion. But he states that watching Children of Men were inevitably reminded of the phrase attributed to Frederick Jameson on Anislavos Zizek, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the, F, the end of capitalism. And, and this is so really because you think back on capitalism, what is, what is happening really here is that children, children of men it's creating this dystopic future, but with uh, the tools of our present. It is a, a, what we see in, in children and men, it's almost a carbon copy of our present. We've recognized all these dystopic political tropes. We can see and, and recognize how racism works in that dystopic future. How's that very similar to the way it works in our present? How the inequality is very similar, how the political extremism is very similar, how the apolitical cynicism is it's very similar, the climate crisis. And what is the what this is creating is an existential angst uh, that is defining our present capitalist dystopia. So it's basically saying your present. And, the, and your dystopic present will be your dystopic future. And those things overlap. And that's why you cannot really imagine the end of capitalism because your present and your future are the same. And the only thing that is different is the past, uh, right? And the past cannot be changed. Uh, so the past cannot change, changed, change. And the past is your present and it's also your future. Then nothing can be changed. So capitalism, uh, it's, it's cutting through your imagination. Now, here comes what Freddie, Fred Blocks, Fred Block was uh, was saying previously, which this could be just a matter of asking the right question. Maybe imagining or when we think about alternatives to capitalism in terms of the ending of capitalism, the opposition and the ending of capitalism, we may be asking the wrong question. And I actually think we're asking the wrong question. Um, and perhaps the trick, the analytical trick here has to do with um, thinking beyond the binary of capitalist economic and its opposition, right? As it is alternative, as opposed and try to think in terms of capitalist parallelisms in parallel to capitalist modes of social political relations. Um, so for that, I really lean on on Debbie Graeber, the late Debbie Graeber, um, who was an anthropologist um, who really thought capitalism from all these different perspectives and he thought it uh, uh, from with from a big picture, from a theoretical point of view, but also doing uh, very uh, 
very specific ethnographic studies. So if you get your hands of any of Graver's books, uh, it's it's just basically a wealth of knowledge, really fun to read too. But um, let's let's not get delayed by how much I like David Graver. Um, I think what he brings um, to the to the discussion, the valuable thing that he brings to the discussion, is this idea, this provocative idea uh, of uh, the, that we are already communist. That you don't have to look for an oppositional force to capitalism, but it's already here. It's already in us. Uh, it's a question simply of changing our perspectives. And this is a very, it is a very anthropological perspective, perspective right? Uh, it's trying to not think in terms of binaries, but in, in terms of relations, in terms of relation, whether are human relations or political relations or social relations. So in that sense, really capitalism and its opposition anti-capitalism and you know communism and socialism or you know cap so or, or the, these ideologies they're really just typologies of political thinking that find their meaning in their opposition to each other their meaning is found in capitalism and it's uh on its other side right and in that dialectic but what happens and then the question gets you trapped into uh, in, in, into the wrong answers uh, because precisely the force of capitalist imagination, uh, you can only think in terms of opposition to that capitalist imagination and you cannot think beyond the capitalist imagination. You cannot think the end of capitalist imagination because capitalist imagination is cutting through every uh, social interaction, uh, every social and political interaction that we are having uh, at a global level, right? So the problem here is that we we may be asking the wrong question then. So is how, why don't we go beyond that binary, beyond that dialectic of capitalism, anti-capitalism? Um, and again, I want to emphasize this is not because it's really incorrect or because a materialist Marxian political economy is getting you the wrong answers. I don't think that is the case. I actually think it's very useful to understand labor, uh, labor power relations, and class worth and class struggle, and a, a heap of other um, political economic relations uh, within capitalism. I think it's very useful. But my point is that uh, from an anthropological sociological perspective, it is more useful. Uh, to understand capitalism beyond this dialectic. And Graver comes from the anarchist tradition. It's a, the it's a theory of anarchism too. And he proposes that um, this possibility uh, of thinking in parallel to capitalism, uh, that this is really a lived experience that we need to revalue we need to uh, so not only reevaluate but re revalue, give it another value, um, and that we could do this if we start ditching all these ideological rituals that we have. And he uses a, a really telling example, which is the ideology, the ideology of work, and these ideological rituals that are imposed by our capitalist system of living uh, locks us. Uh, lock, lock us in this binary thinking of capitalist imagination and its opposite, and that's it. Um, and doesn't allow us to think in terms of parallel to this capitalist imagination, right? So he get into this ideology of, the ideology of work and how that visual can be thought uh, beyond uh, beyond this capitalist binary. So I'm just gonna play this beautiful clip of Debbie Graver talking about the value of work. Insofar as it will be possible to create a viable economy that won't destroy the planet, we're going to have to think very seriously about what it is we consider to be valuable in work to begin with. 
So, you know, when I meet people at parties, I would often say, oh, I'm an anthropologist, what do you do? And people would not want to admit it, you know. And um, after you get them a little drunk, um, they'll say, well, you know, actually I'm the senior East Coast vision manager for this. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't actually do anything. You know, I mean, we write reports and then have meetings and give them to other people who have meetings about the reports. Or they would say, well, I don't really do anything. I have this computer job where I could automate it and, you know, like software could do the whole thing, but don't, don't tell my boss, right? So there's all these people who just personally feel their jobs don't actually do anything. And that's fascinating to me. I mean, because a huge percent of the workforce, I thought, you know, 20, 30 percent, were sitting there every day thinking, I'm not actually doing anything. I hope nobody figures it out. I mean, what does that do to the collective soul? I mean, how could you have dignity and labor if you purchase? Like, how is it? Especially, you know, you can see how in the Soviet system they're making up jobs to keep everybody working or looking like they're working because they have a full employment ideology. Capitalism is supposed to be the opposite. A capital private firm should not be hiring people who don't do anything. But, like, it's happening all over the place. So... I tried to figure out how it happened. I realized it has to do with our ideology of work. It's one of the real impediments towards creating any kind of sane society is that, you know, in the 19th century, social movements are actually quite successful in inculcating a labor theory of value. That and it was an industrial-based, you know, labor theory of value. It took the factory work as a sort of primary idea of work. But people really believed it. But it was very flawed because it was very androcentric. It had to do this ideal of productive male factory labor as this kind of paradigm for all work. And as a result, it was kind of easy to attack. So that suddenly you have this counteroffensive in the 20th century where this idea is replaced by the notion that productivity comes from the brains of entrepreneurs and you're just a bunch of robots you know, sort of carrying out their commands. Um, so then the question became how to validate work. So they really pushed this originally Puritan idea that work is just valuable in itself. It doesn't have to produce anything. It's just, you know, if you're not working at something you don't particularly like, you're just a bad person, work shapes character. So in a perverse way, the uselessness of the work actually became a virtue um, because anything that made the work fulfilling sort of undercut that disciplinary um, role of work. And, and this is the way people think nowadays. You know, that's how you have these corporations that don't feel they have to pay people to do art or translation or you know, anything that you might do because you actually have some interest in the subject, but are willing to shell out all this money on corporate lawyers and strategic vision coordinators and, and people like that. So, so I think that the only way to shift this is we really need to move toward a new idea of what is valuable in labor. But I would suggest a labor theory of value that starts with women's work, carrying labor as the paradigm. During Occupy Wall Street, we had this web page called the We Are the 99% where people could um, talk about their life situation and why they supported the occupations. You know, 80% of them were women, and even the men were almost always in caring professions. They were, or they were teachers, or they were, you know, just doing social work of some kind or they were in medicine, but they all had the same complaint. I want to do a job which actually where I care for other people and benefit them in some way, but if you want to do that, they'll pay you so little that you're in such debt you can't take care of your own family. So I, I almost thought of this movement as the revolt of the caring classes. So I think we are at the brink of a reformulation of what work is and what is valuable about it that could really lead to a reformulation of how we organize everything, uh, how, what we think production even is. Uh, you know, production is ultimately the production of people. Uh, production of commodities is a secondary moment which enables us to produce people that we'd like to have around. That's what life is really about. Okay, so it's about producing people that we like to have around. So we produce people that we like to have around, i.e. we produce communities of people that care for each other. Uh, we start rethinking what value is beyond work. And the problem with capitalism is that capitalism only asks questions in, ter in terms of the capitalism and anti-capitalism. Anti the opposition to capitalism only asks questions around the value of work. Uh, how can we value that work over that other work? How can we value teachers over uh, Wall Street investors or uh, real estate agents? Uh, how much money should we pay them? But how about we change the paradigm and we think in parallel to that and we think about a question of value that has to do with people, that is people-centric, that is human-centric. And here... Um, so it, as an alternative to capitalism, you see an alternative to capitalism in this case doesn't mean an opposition to capitalism, but in parallel, even in parallel and beyond capitalist 
modalities, capitalist imaginations, whether they're opposed to capitalism or whether they come from inside uh, the capitalist system or the capitalist imagination, imagination itself. And one way of doing this, one of the first ways of doing this, I argue, is that we need to really imagine capitalism beyond the Anglosphere. And the problem with the Anglosphere here has to do um, with knowledge production. It's not so much English as English as a language, but the production that was created uh, in the center of knowledge uh, that, uh, that, that spoke English. Um, and again, it's not the language here, but it's how knowledge is produced and from where it's produced and how Anglo-centric it is. And in here, Anglo-centric is not really a euphemism for whiteness. That's a, that's a completely different story, uh, which is also, you know, it, it's also important and relevant. But in here, I'm talking about much of a bigger picture. I'm talking about historically, right? I'm talking about centers of knowledge and how those centers of knowledge forces uh, the periphery to acquire this Anglo-centric uh, knowledge production approach, uh, in which um, you it, not so much, you write in English, obviously, or you you present in English, or you think in English, but it's 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 not really again not the question of language here. It's the question of the ideas that are valid are produced from these center from these centers. Of, of knowledge. And in here, I'm really thinking, but the primary example is really uh, the prestigious university. If you look at the list of prestigious universities throughout the world, uh, they're mostly Anglo-centric. And, you know, China is coming out uh, as a challenger. Uh, but um, I doubt, and I, I, I very much doubt that chi Chinese universities are really a challenge, a real challenge to knowledge production. They're a challenge to capitalist mode, maybe really a challenge of to a specific type of capitalist uh, type of knowledge production, but they're not challenging the Anglo-centric uh, knowledge production in the sense that the, the, the ideas that come out uh, from these centers they all are either critiques or traditions from so-called Western uh, knowledge production, Western thought. You can find the critique of Western thought, or you can find uh, a, a tradition with the down Western thought. And what most of the Chinese universities, I would argue, are doing, are doing a version of that, of how can we be better? in producing an alternative in the sense, an oppositional view to Western thought. And therefore, they're not really, uh, it, they're not asking the right question, which is how can we go beyond that Anglosphere, that Anglocentric production of knowledge, right? And, and in that sense, if we are able to do that, uh, and it, and, and I will give you just a couple of examples of how can we do that and how problematic it is. Um, we can start thinking uh, beyond, uh, beyond the DAP version of, 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 of this knowledge production and, and, and think um, beyond this Anglo-centric Anglo production of ideas. And I want to emphasize this, that Anglo-centric production of ideas has not to do really with language, although obviously language is a very important part of it, uh, but it has to do with tradition, ideological tradition, traditions. I, and ideological here is not in the sense of, of ideology so much as the production of ideas, all right? So knowledge production and, and how every, most of the most visible knowledge production is thought at either from within the Western uh, knowledge production production or an challenge to that Western knowledge production uh, in terms of basically making that West, considering that Western knowledge is obsolete and that needs to be uh, revamped and re retuned uh, um, fine tune and and thought. So it's it it that is the issue. That is that dialectic that I think uh, gets you to ask the wrong question and that get, gives you answers 
that are not um, allow us, uh, that doesn't allow us to think beyond capitalism. And, and thinking beyond capitalism is important um, for many reasons, but, but I think it's all around us that different type of like dystopic scenarios that we are confronted with is going to require us to think beyond capitalism in parallel to capitalism. And I think that's why it's important from a, and a, for strictly politically speaking. Uh, I'm just gonna play this uh, this this video of, of Bon Joon Ho, who was the director of Parasites, which you also uh, watch for, 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 this, um, for this unit. Um, Precisely because I think it's a it's an interesting um, it 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 it's an interesting um, kind of approach to 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 film that is telling or, or that is that yeah maybe that is simply interesting. I just want to play it because I, I I think it's also pertinent since we we watched Parasites. Wow! Amazing! Unbelievable! Yeah, I'm foreign language filmmaker, so I have a translator here. Please understand. <laughs> no, <laughs> 그 자막 서브타이틀의 장벽을 장벽도 아니죠 한 1인치 정도 되는 그 장벽을 뛰어넘으면 여러분들이 훨씬 더 많은 영화를 즐길 수 있습니다. Once you overcome the one-inch tall barrier of subtitles, you will be introduced to so many more amazing films. <laughs> One, I thought it was an amazing metaphor, but it's a metaphor really because Parasite, it's a, it's, it, it's such a, um, such a forceful critique of our current capitalism from this uh, non-Anglo perspective, which are the same, that from all these different ideas uh, of what capitalism is and it's not, um, that precisely uh, the director saying that maybe if we get over uh, in the Anglo-centric sphere, that titles uh, or that labels film foreign and non-foreign and and and, and indigenous uh, linguistic indigenous right in the as the Oscars, uh, and if we get away from that divide maybe we could start actually uh, acquiring all these different type of imaginations um, that the Anglo-centric sphere doesn't allow us. And here, is, it, this is really a metaphor, right? For Anglo-centric subtitles are just that tool that would allow us to think beyond the Anglosphere. Um, so one way of um, looking beyond this Anglosphere is that the uh, Buen Vivir, which is a um, Spanish uh, translation, that's really a very poor translation of the Quechua language, Suma Kawase, which means really uh, life in, in harmony, not so much Buen Vivir, because Buen Vivir is translated as good living or good life, but Suma Kawase really is translated as life in harmony. And Altman is uh, the, uh, the academic article that it's assigned for this module, his critique of Buen Vivir is really interesting because it it's actually puts us in this position in which uh, being Anglo-centric, be going beyond Anglo-centrism, it uh, has different layers. It's not just going beyond the knowledge production uh, that comes out Western tradition and its opposite, and the and and the challengers of uh, Western tradition is not just that you know uh, looking at Sumakwasa, but the next layer is how even within the global South there is a dynamic uh, that is extractive that is still that is colonial beyond the global south global north relationships and how uh simply adopting these others uh um ideas won't get us beyond an alternative to capitalism and it's actually quite problematic um and and the point that he makes uh is that this translation of, um, of ideas, they are not just simply a question of 
translating linguistic meaning. It's not a question of just subtitling something and understanding it for our own purposes. Uh, the problem with translation or what we lose in translation is that we are omitting uh, the, uh, the knowledge production of the, the tradition and the community from which that translation comes. So it is really a question. Translation in this case is the production of knowledge of the non-existent, of that that doesn't exist. And this is maybe to an abstract theoretical term, but the idea is that the moment you translate something uh, from a position of power, from a colonial position, that translation is no more a translation. It's a production of a non-existence. You are erasing the original indigenous concept and the community that comes from, because what is important is the translation. What gets reproduced and produced is the translation. In this case, this is an intellectual extraction that erases the indigenous or the original to accommodate it into this existence in the sense that only colonial knowledge production is the only thing that exists. Well, indigenous knowledge production doesn't exist. It's only translated. It doesn't have political agency. And then become this colonial enterprise. It's a form of what is called epistemic extractivism. And it's beyond the global South, global North relationship. And this, um, uh, and this is what's really interesting, right? So here we have this Suma Kause and Alman's critique of how uh, intellectuals in the global south in Latin America, they are, um, they may be well intentioned in their appropriation of Suma Kawase as one belief, as you know, good life or good living. But his critique is that Suma Kawase cannot just be another anti capitalist container. It cannot be, because Suma Kawase is not about that. Suma Kawase is not Kawase, it's not Suma Kawase, it's not. Uh, is not asking the wrong question, it's asking actually and answering the right question, which is going beyond capitalism, it's parallel to capitalism, and uh, in that it's a localized, localized practice that evolves from indigenous tradition before even capitalism existed. So in that sense, it's already going, it's already beyond capitalism, but that, um, that intellectual tradition, that uh, intellectual, spiritual, and um, communal tradition, it is in place, it, it is in place, occurs in place. And now this is beyond the ethical concerns that we may have in the sense that we maybe, if we sort of ap appropriate or we um, incur in this epistemic extractivism, we're basically recolonizing uh, indigenous knowledges. Uh, beyond those ethical concerns, there is also a question of it simply doesn't work. It simply doesn't work because summa quasi cannot just be transport, transposed and uprooted from the local practice for the same reasons, for instance, and this is, um, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a tenuous uh, analogy that I'm making, but, but I think it's useful to make my point. In the same way that the lived experience of certain political actors, and I'm using here racialized people in the US, how that lived experience that is very specific to, uh, to American history kind of be transposed and uprooted and transposed to an exogenous political tradition. So I'm thinking how the Black Lives uh, Movement, the global reach and its impact on other countries turned out to be very substantially performative. It didn't, in the, in, in the original sense, in the, in, in the sense that, you know, BLM was 
a US phenomenon. Then it could have evolved and it could have connected at some level with, uh, um, with indigenous traditions of anti-racism, but what surfaced, what was visible really uh, was a kind of performative, a sub unsubstantial attempt at protesting uh, different type of racisms through BLM. And, has to, and that has to do, that ineffectiveness has precisely to do with that. Uh, because BLM it is a, was a local practice that then was, uh, was globally exported and it didn't really work. So in this sort of tenuous analogy, this is why also uh, the transposition, the uprooting and transposition of Sumakawase doesn't really work, right? It cannot be a Taylor's box concept. And, and here you have basically a quote from, from Almond and, uh, around why uh, how is it when we're translating and the problems that we have? So I'm just going to skip over this in the for the sake of time. Um, so now um, there is another. If this is the case, if if we need to really pay attention to to this in place knowledge production and this indigenous knowledge uh, cannot go. Uh, beyond its local, or should not go beyond its local pra practice, unless not to, in order not to engage in epistemic extractivism or recolonizing uh, knowledge, the knowledge production of indig indigenous people. Then we have to actually then pause for a moment and critique our own transnational approach. And in what sense or to what extent uh, uh, our transnational transnationalism, global and even global, and global here is the global local uh, approach, how those agendas, how these agendas are cosmopolitan mask that may be just aiding with hiding the extraction colonization of indigenous knowledges because these indigenous knowledges are always local, they're in place and they're based on forceful, forcefully or impose a static historical relationships. Their relationship, they're static, they're stuck and static. They don't move in the past precisely because the colonial imposition put them in that place. And there's not been really a reckoning of and a reparation and a resurfacing of indigenous knowledge and practice and community. So make transnational approaches imply the extraction of local indigenous in place community. It implies the translation at a transnational level because that's the only way a transnational um, uh, interchange uh, or network can occur. It has to be done in translation. And when we are done in translation, we may be um, partaking of this uh, and of this production of the non-existence, that is translation of the indigenous into the only existing knowledge production, which is the colonial uh, knowledge production. Yeah. So in that sense, transnationalism may be incurring in that um, in that scene, right? You're making be, be partaking in that in that that scene, so to speak, right? Um, and then in here, uh, Adman goes into precisely what is it that is uh, Sumakase. And Sumakase has these three in interrelated principles. And these interrelated principles are in place. They're a place based concepts that are defined by the relationship between a territory and the, the territory and the inhabitants of that territory. And you cannot separate this territory from the knowledge production that comes out of this territory, the history of the territory, and especially the pre-colonial history and the colonial history. Uh, and that's why it cannot really be transported. Now, then there is two, for instance, two principles that comes with uh, good living uh, that are very usually translated and transported into, um, for instance, ideas of degrowth, uh, which we will see next week. Uh, and, and this idea of decentralization and, and federation of communities and the, 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 
necessary dialogue between nature and the spiritual dimension of nature and how to incorporate that into everyday life. And the problem with that is that that becomes that translated uh, um, uh, extractive epistemic extractivism that trans uh, that production of the non-existence uh, uh, and erase the in place localized contextual context based knowledge production of the indigenous peoples that uh, for for whom Sumakar say uh, is always in place and it's in parallel and beyond capitalism is not simply just an opposition to capitalism. That is, uh, uh, again, um, that comes from uh, this dialectic of capitalism, anti-capitalism that has to do with uh, colonial Western thought. Um, so when I say colonial Western thought, I'm also thinking about the anti-colonial Western thought. So don't get me wrong with this, I'm thinking, uh, this in terms of colonial and anti-colonialism uh, uh, that doesn't come out of indigenous people themselves. Yeah, so this is what I'm referring to. Um, so one needs to go and think against appropriation and we need to think in terms of restoration and restoration from a non-paternalistic point of view, restoration as in indigenous knowledge uh, will resurface when indigenous communities gain political agency. And in that sense, uh, uh, the, the indigenous communities that, uh, that um, practice Suma Kaose, they were already and are already communist in the sense that David Greber think that we or are already communists in terms of that provocative approach, right? Um, so uh, really there is an irony here, right? That, um, and I, I like you to just take a minute and, and, and read uh, Konaye, um, a statement about the importance precisely of, of, of Sumakase and their, their, way, their way they think life, right? And just you can take that a reading, but I need to skip just for the sake of time, sake of brevity, right? But but then there, there's an irony here is that in that that our transnational in our transnational approach to find alternatives to capitalism, uh, we have we have found that one of the richest alternatives already exists. One of these richest alternatives to global capitalism uh, is in the simple resurfacing of local communal indigenous practice practices, right? So in order to think transnationally, we had to go back to something that was already in place and that was very local. Uh, and, you know, and that um, it's, it's very ironic and interesting. Um, so I will finish with, um, how beyond the specificity of Sumaco say of any other ind indigenous knowledge production, because I'm, I'm using that uh, mostly as an example of localized uh, theory and how that localized theory needs to be taken account in practice, in context, in very specific context. And we need to really guard against appropriation of those knowledge and leave those knowledge in place. But that doesn't mean that we cannot learn from their theoretical praxis. We're not appropriating their praxis. We're not saying, hey, let's translate their praxis into our own context. What I'm arguing for is to rethink our theory and our practice in terms of their theoretical praxis and see what kind of parallels we can come up with in order to create an even bigger parallel to capitalist structures within our own context, right? Uh, so that's why I say here that, and I wanna emphasize that that doesn't mean that we are simply translating their practice into our foreign and out of place context. 
what we are want us to take from what I've um, said so far is that the important the important part of the critical issue here is to rethink in to rethink that theory in practice from the point of view of political embodiment, our own political embodiment. So what is the embodiment of a good life in our specific lived context? And embodiment here is a very important uh, part of the piece of the puzzle uh, because embodiment implies a theoretical practice that will ask the right question because it's in the right context, it's embodied in the lived experience of our lived context, right? And this can be done from our individual level to the community we live in, to the historical political context that we're living and can interact with all these other uh, uh, spaces that can and should practice their own theoretical practices and they, that, that can dialogue then uh, in terms of the specificity of the worldviews as they practice it every day, right? So I'm gonna finish with David Graeber's take on political creativity as an example of how can we rethink or how should we rethink this, um, this theory in practice, uh, our, our, own, uh, our own creative ways of coming up, coming up with, uh, uh, social political parallels to capitalism and not so much opposing uh, or arguing for uh, our current capitalist system or cap uh, within our current capitalist imagination to be more exact. So I'll finish with this. I, I really think that creative solutions are not lacking. I mean, we talk about it as if the big problem is we need to come up with better ideas. How do we solve these terrible, intractable problems? We can't think of ways. Well, that's only if you think within the walls that are created by these structures that we don't like to think are there. Um, given a, a obvious example in the same vein, um, all right, let us imagine, if we're talking about the problems of poverty in the global south, let us imagine that all of those lines were erased. We decided overnight, um, no more border controls. Everybody can live wherever they want. Uh, anybody in Tanzania or Honduras can go to Antwerp or California or wherever they want to go. Well, don't you think that the people running the wealthy countries in the world would decide then that their top priority was to come up with ways to make people in Honduras and Tanzania more inclined to stay there? You don't think they would come up with something? There's all sorts of ideas they'd come up with really fast. Um, <laughs> and this is the major thing that I, I, I want to emphasize, um, is that there is no lack of creative, interesting ideas in the world. In fact, it's the greatest squandered resource in the world is, is all those people out there who got them, have, have no forum in which to say them, or you know, who are literally told to shut up or they'll be beaten or killed. Um, there's probably no person on earth who hasn't thought up of at least one interesting idea that might solve a problem that no one in this room would have thought of. The question is how to unleash that. Um, and in order to be able to do so, in order to create structures where people are encouraged rather than discouraged to come up with these creative solutions, um, we, you need to create context where that kind of group mind, um, actual genuine democracy can take root. And to do that, we have to like challenge those invisible walls. We have to like look at those structures of power more seriously than we've been doing already, I think. Um, because most people in the world go around every day thinking, I know what we could do, but I wish I could only say it. But they can't. Um, now, to do that, it's going to require two things. It's going to require um, not only not telling them to sh shut up, but you know, create a culture of democracy, which oddly enough you know, exists in some parts of the world and doesn't exist in most of the countries that call themselves democratic. I mean, one of the things we found in Occupy Wall Street is that we had to learn everything from scratch. Um, people, don't know, people in America don't know how to do democracy. We never get any experience. Um, that's slow, but it can be done. Um, 
The bigger problem, though, is taking on those structures of inequality, which essentially make it impossible. Um, and in that, I think the Founding Fathers are right. A society divided by fundamental um, inequalities of wealth is never going to be democratic. But I think that perhaps the most compelling reason to want to address those questions is precisely because it would create a society capable of actually solving the problems that the world faces today. All right, so I just want to end by emphasizing the idea that localized practice and theoretical praxis that is in place and is context specific doesn't mean uh, lifting those uh, borders and barriers and kind of going back to uh, the local and forgetting about the global. I'm not saying that. I'm talking in terms of knowledge production, in terms of ideas, in terms of letting those indigenous ideas resurface. Um, doing that for every specific uh, context in which an idea can resurface or actually be produced, uh, in that sense, in that sense, it's an it's an argument for political creativity uh, in a world when um, a structures of inequality and the borders that uh, they create don't exist. So all these different indigenous, uh, indigenous mean uh, context specific, place specific, and, and, and pre-colonial and post-colonial indigenous, uh, all this knowledge can be produced uh, at an equal level, at an equal level, and can actually dialogue, can dialogue and not compete, and not compete, which, uh, it's the only way to go beyond uh, capi the capitalist imagination.